What's up, fellas? My name is Tucker. In today's video, we're going to be talking about potential breakout players for the upcoming NBA season. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like rating on it. Check out my socials up there. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I've got six players on my list. Of course, I'm interested to see what you guys have to say in the comment section about your own breakout candidates for this upcoming season. I'm also going to give you an interesting stat with each player. We begin the list with a little bit of a uh, unconventional choice for a breakout player. This player averaged more points per game last year than John Morant, Michael Porter Jr., Anthony Edwards, and John Collins. And that player is Karis Lever of the Indiana Pacers. And I understand that it's a bit odd to consider him as a breakout guy because typically we think of breakout players as ones that haven't really found their spot in the league yet. Guys that are a little bit younger and they just haven't really, as the name implies, broken out into what their true role is gonna be. But I put Karis LeVert on this list because I feel like some people have forgotten about him a little bit and the Pacers as a whole, and I get to make points about both of those in this section. So for LeVert specifically, I think people would be surprised to learn that he did score over 20 points per game on average throughout the season last year. Granted, didn't play in as many games as he would have liked to for a variety of different reasons, but Karis LeVert is a talented perimeter player. Indiana has a couple of really nice perimeter guys, but the one that I think has the most upside here is LeVert. I think he's going to have a nice season for Indiana. And the Pacers as a whole, by the way, a team that finished 34 and 38 last year with a coach that did not appear to be any good in a, a very dysfunctional situation and an injury riddled situation I would be very surprised if Indiana struggles to make the postseason again this year I know that the east is better and people are going to be more excited about teams like Atlanta and like Chicago and I get that but this is a deep roster it's a flexible roster and it's one that has moves to make as well with the Miles Turner to bonus bonus combination and I think potentially leading the way will be Karis LeVert who yes is not as young as you would typically expect a breakout player to be and we'll get to a lot of the younger guys on this list here further down uh, but I did want to mention Karis Karis LeVert, because I think he's an awesome candidate, is a guy that could average 20 points per game again next season and do it on a team that's really good, and that will get a lot of people's attention, so he is on the list. Next up, I'll give you my stat once again. This player had three or more blocks in 23% of his regular season games last year. So in almost a quarter of the games that this player appeared in, he had three or more blocks in those individual games. It's a player that I'm sure a lot of people expected to see on this list and it's Robert Williams of the Boston Celtics. I think there are a couple of different reasons why a breakout season could be in store for him. One, opportunity. Other than Al Horford, who we don't really know what his role is going to be, I think he's going to contribute, but you could argue that he's not going to be the starting five for Boston. I think there's plenty of opportunity for Robert Williams, and he was given more of that last year and certainly stepped up well into that role. And he has all the talent in the world. He can be a great rim protector. He's a really, really good athlete and someone that's just going to be able to do a lot of the things that Boston is going to ask him to. He got his contract, doesn't have to worry about that. There's no pressure on him to perform in any kind of crazy way. He can just go out there and do good basketball things and potentially put up really good statistics at the same time. The thing that's going to hold Robert Williams back potentially is the thing that has kind of been holding him back for the entirety of his NBA career, and that is health. We saw that in the playoffs last year. He even, you know, with some of the injuries he was dealing with. He had nine blocks in game one against the Nets last year and was an absolute force defensively, but he just wasn't able to stay healthy throughout the entirety of the series. And that's going to continue to be a theme for him. If Robert Williams is healthy, he's going to be a breakout player. I don't know that he's going to be like an all-star or anything or defense player of the year or anything like that, but I think an all-defense team could definitely be in store for him as a guy that can switch a little bit on the perimeter, really good ball screen defender potentially, and an excellent rim protector. And then got, I think that stat from last year definitely demonstrates that. This player has never had a 20-point game in his career, but... He averaged over 11 points per game on his new team after being traded mid-season last year. And that player is RJ Hampton of the Orlando Magic. I put out a tweet the other day asking you guys for who you thought your breakout players were going to be for this upcoming season. And I listed RJ Hampton as mine. And I know that it's a bit of an odd selection. It's a Magic team that is potentially going to be the worst team in the league next year. And they have no shortage of guards. They drafted Jalen Suggs. They have Cole Anthony from a year before. Markel Fultz will be coming back. You've got RJ Hampton. Here's my reasoning, a couple of reasons. One, I think that there's definitely talent here with RJ Hampton. When you watched him last year with Orlando, when you watch him in Summer League this year, there's length, athleticism, quickness, some individual scoring ability. And I think on a, on a team like Orlando, he's a really good candidate because he's going to get plenty of opportunities to just kind of work through some of his, his struggles. And I think that's all he needs. I think he just needs to play. I think he needs to understand the speed and quickness of the NBA game as a guy that took a non-traditional path to the NBA. 
And I think he, out of all the guards there in Orlando, to fit alongside Jalen Suggs, I think he's the most ideal fit. I think he's a more natural two guard than either Fultz or Anthony. I think they're obviously going to be very invested in Suggs and making sure that he is their primary perimeter guy moving forward. And I think that as long as he can continue to grow and develop as a defender as an, as an, and as an individual scorer and as an off-ball shooter, he can be a nice piece for Orlando moving forward. I'm not saying he's going to average 20 a game this year, but on a team that's going to be bad, I wouldn't be surprised to see him averaging, you know, 15 and four this year and on, on some decent shooting splits. And that would certainly be a breakout season compared to what he did last year, where yes, he was a good player once he came over from Orlando statistically, but he still has yet to score a 20 point game in the regular season in the NBA in his career. RJ Hampton's a guy to keep an eye on from a talent, a fit, and an opportunity perspective for this upcoming season. Next up now is a guy that I've already made a video about him. A lot of people know that I, I love this player. He had a higher three-point percentage last year at over 39% as a player that is not known as a three-point jump shooter. That percentage, 39.1, was higher than Nikola Jokic, Karl Anthony Towns, and Lonzo Ball. And that player is Patrick Williams. Now, granted, he didn't qualify for the three-point percentage leaderboards last year because he didn't take enough of them but when you look at what Chicago did to this roster I know that the talk is about Levine and Ball and DeRozan but you could argue that a lot of the moves that they made revolve around Patrick Williams because he's the only guy that does stuff other than what the other guys on the roster already do he provides versatility he can play the four he can play some small ball five he can be an incredible perimeter defender length activity all the in-between things is what Patrick Williams is supposed to provide, and they're going to be counting on him to provide. There's no Lowry marketing in his way. It's just Patrick Williams needs to be our versatile front court player and showed some promise last year as a perimeter spacer, which is going to potentially be the most value that he provides on the offensive end of the floor. He looked a little bit uncomfortable at times in Summer League having to create his own shot, but that's fine. That's what Summer League is for. You put him in a position that he's not used to being in, and it just allows him to grow and expand his game while not having to actually do that in an NBA game. I'm very high on Patrick Williams, whether it be this season or moving forward. I think he's going to be an awesome player, and as long as he is what the Bulls need him to be, they can certainly be a good team this year. I think a lot of their success is not going to be determined by DeMar DeRozan, Zach Levine, Lonzo Ball. We know what those guys are, potentially fit issues and how are they going to coexist, sure. But individually, we know what those guys are. What we need for Chicago to be successful this season is Patrick Williams to be the glue guy, the guy that defends, the guy that's protecting the rim, the one that is spacing off the ball for these guys offensively. And I'm all in on Patrick Williams, whether it be this up upcoming season or moving forward. Second to last now on the list, here's their stat. This player only started in eight games last year, but in those games that he started, he averaged over 18 points per game at 18.6. And that player is Tyrese Maxey of the Philadelphia 76ers, a guy that looked good in summer league. And when you go and look at his stats from a per game basis scoring wise, his percentages, his stuff in the playoffs, there's nothing entirely exciting there on paper for Tyrese Maxey, but he's definitely for me an eye test guy. When you watch him, you see the athleticism, you see the quickness, you see how easily he can get to the rim. And as long as he can round out his offensive game, he has all the tools defensively to be very, very good as well, especially for a, for, for a Philadelphia team that does not inspire a lot of confidence when it comes to their true backcourt players. If you don't consider Ben Simmons to be a guard, there's not a lot of positives with the backcourt players there in Philadelphia. And so Tyrese Maxey could be a guy that they really, really rely on this year or potentially could end up on a different team as part of a Ben Simmons trade package going along with Simmons somewhere else, which could provide him a nice opportunity to break out statistically as well. Of all the players on this list, I'm not incredibly confident that Tyrese Maxey is going to be scoring like 15 a game next year, but I think in terms of him being critical to a legitimate postseason threat, he probably has the best chance of anybody on this list of fulfilling that promise. And as a result, I definitely see him as a breakout guy next year. Last up now on the list, this is potentially my favorite player on the entire list because most of the other guys, there's some draft pedigree and people are like, oh yeah, this guy's going to be good. Of course he is. This one I feel like is a little bit more under the radar. This player in every single game last year that they got 20 or more minutes with the exception of one game, they scored in double figures. 
They also, by the way, led the playoffs in multiple statistical categories, field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage. They were second in the postseason in blocks per game, granted a small sample size. And that player is Daniel Gafford. I I am I'm all in on Daniel Gafford as a really, really good five man for Washington. It seems odd that Chicago was so willing to just give this guy up. And when he gets minutes and he plays, he produces statistically. He's there at least as a deterrent at the rim. He's a great lob threat, super athletic, big guy. Doesn't have the height that you would like to have out of the five spot, but he has length and athleticism to make up for it. And whether it's him or Thomas Bryant, whoever else Washington wants to put at the five spot, they've kind of found a solution there but between a couple of different young guys once Thomas Bryant comes back. But I love Daniel Gafford. I think he provides awesome energy, and he's just a guy that continually gets overlooked. And for a Washington team that if they keep Beal could be decent this upcoming season, Gafford could settle in as the starting five uh, You know, moving forward. They're going to have plenty of different options there. Like I said, him, Bryant, uh, Montrezl Harrell, who means on the team, uh, when the season starts, but I'm all in on Daniel Gafford. I love what he brings to the floor, and I definitely think he is an overlooked guy and for sure a breakout candidate. And yeah, that's my list. Karis LeVert, Robert Williams, RJ Hampton, Patrick Williams, Tyrese Maxey, and Daniel Gafford. I just realized every single one of these players is in the Eastern Conference. Cool. Let me know down in the comment section below uh, who you guys have as breakout players for this upcoming season. I asked that on Twitter the other day, but I'm interested uh, what you guys have to say down below as well. With all those things said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to leave a like rating on it. Check out more videos from me, the boxes on screen, and uh, check out my socials down in the description below as well. With all those things said, hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day. Once again, my name is Tucker, and I will see you all next time.